Okay, <clears throat> let me pick back up here, a quick summary of where I think the, uh, you know, what Peter has said, as I always say when we're studying, what I try to do is I try to track the flow of thought. It's a letter where, in one sense, reading somebody else's mail, in one sense. And so I, I try to track the thought, and so I want to keep you in line with where I am and then present how I understand it, and I just give that to you for, for your consideration. In verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1, Peter refers to the fact that Christians have been blessed with everything necessary for godly living and with the precious and very great promises of Christ's consummating return and the new heavens and new earth as identified in, in chapter 3. So he, he identifies those blessings in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1. And then in verses 5 through 7, he says that because Jesus has given us these blessings, we must make every effort to be morally and ethically pure. We must labor to have and to grow in these certain virtues or qualities that he lists and that we talked about. He identifies them there in verses 5 through 7. And he indicates in verse 8 that, that this is what it means to be useful and fruitful in one's knowledge of Christ. That's what it means to be a productive, fruitful Christian is to have and to grow in these virtues that he has been talking about. He says in verse 9 that the unfruitful Christian, the person without these ethical manifestations of faith, that person is blind in that he cannot see the implications of his salvation. He's forgotten the significance of his prior cleansing of sin. He's living as though that prior forgiveness doesn't mean anything to him. He's living not caring how the one who showed him such great mercy calls him to live. Here he's been given this tremendous thing, this tremendous act of mercy by God, and he's living like, you know, frankly, I don't care what you want. So he's living that way, he's blind in that sense. He tells him in verses 10 and 11 of chapter 1 that exerting effort to grow spiritually will be a safeguard to them in doing this. In this way, they will, they will be assured that they'll never stumble from the path they're on. And this path they're on is a path that leads to the consummated kingdom, that leads to eternal glory, that leads to the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's saying this is a safeguard to you, that you continue, you have these things and you grow in them, and in that way you'll never stumble and you'll receive a, this rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because spiritual growth is a safeguard from falling away from the faith, and thus it's relevant to their entering the consummated kingdom, it's very important. And for that reason, Peter tells them in verses 12 through 15 that as long as he's alive, he's going to remind them of these things, and he's going to do all that he can to ensure they remember them even after his impending death. It's that important. Calling one another, reminding one another of the importance of this submission, this importance of staying attached to Christ, living in surrender to Him, living bowed before Him. That is so important. Having these qualities, these virtues, growing in them, keep you on there, that Peter says, I'm going to do everything I can to ensure that you are reminded of these things even after I'm dead. So I raised the question last week, what ought we be doing? You see, in terms of encouraging one another, reminding one another of the importance of this. In 16 to 18, he says that staying on the path that leads to the eternal kingdom, the consummated kingdom, staying on that path, he doesn't spell all this out, but he connects it with four. See, it's so important because the kingdom is definitely going to be consummated. See, contrary to what the false teachers were saying, the apostolic preaching about Christ's consummating return, it wasn't based on some cleverly concocted myth. See, not at all. He, he says, that, look, he and James and John, see, James, Peter, and John, that they saw in the transfiguration the one who was too glorious to leave creation in its current corrupt state, to leave that unfinished. They saw in the transfiguration, the glory of Christ, and thus they saw one who necessarily would return in power to consummate the kingdom of God, to usher in that eternal state where there'll be no sin, no suffering, no death, no mourning, no crying and pain. He says, listen, this is definitely going to happen. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty in that event. But that's not all, okay? It's definitely going to, you need to stay on this path 
This is important because it's not going to be a case of at the end you get there and it's an empty basket. It is the kingdom is definitely going to be consummated. You will receive that welcome into that. He is coming. And he says, I know that because we didn't follow these cleverly concocted stories as the false teachers are claiming. When they said, no, 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 that stuff's not happening. They were just following a myth when they told you that. He says, baloney. We were eyewitnesses of what happened in the transfiguration. And that is in some sense a preview that we were given of his coming. But he says there's more. And then he says, he says, and we have the holy, reliable, prophetic word to which you do well in paying attention as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy ever was brought by the will of man. Rather, men being moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So he tells them here that, look, in, in, addition, in addition to the eyewitness testimony of what they experienced in the transfiguration, they can be certain Christ is returning because they have the holy, reliable, prophetic word that testifies to that return. Now, there's a little translation issue here. Okay, I take this, there, there's a, a, comparative, uh, a comparative word here, and I take it as a, as a superlative. Your translation may say, you know, that we have this word made more certain. Okay, there's a word here that can, that can function as a superlative or an elative, which is how I take it. So I say, and we have the holy reliable. That's the way the TNIV takes it. That's the way the New English translation takes it. That's the way a number of commentators take it, like Balcom and Norman Hillier and some others. That makes better sense to me than taking it as a true comparative of saying more certain. So that's the first thing if you're looking, saying, why does this read this way? That's why. Okay, he says, and we have the wholly reliable, the completely reliable, the altogether, the very certain, altogether certain prophetic word. And the prophetic word refers either to the entire Old Testament scriptures, okay, to all of them, in keeping with a, a, Jew, a common Jewish view that all inspired scripture is prophetic. See, it's prophetic in that sense that it's being inspired. And you can look at uh, uh, Paul's phrase in Romans 16, 26, where he refers to prophetic scriptures. So there was a common Jewish view that all inspired scripture was prophetic. So he may just be referring to all of the Old Testament. He doesn't specify. Or he could be referring to specific prophecies that are part of the Old Testament. In either case, it's clear he's referring to the scriptures, to writings, because in verse 20 he says, no prophecy of Scripture. So he's talking about the Old Testament, all of it, or he's talking about specific prophecies in the Old Testament. He doesn't identify any specific text to which he's referring, but there are a number of passages that early Christians recognized as referring to the Messiah's coming in judgment. And from that, they then saw that as a reference to Christ's return, because they see these texts that say the Messiah comes in judgment, Jesus is the Messiah, hasn't come in judgment, so those texts testify to his return in judgment. And included among those texts is Psalm chapter 2, verse 9, Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14, Numbers 24, 17, and you can also look at Isaiah 63, 1 through 6. So there were a number of texts, he could be referring to those, he could be referring to all of the Old Testament scriptures. But he tells them that they will do well to pay attention to this holy, reliable, prophetic word. This word that you can trust. This word that you can take to the bank. They'll do well to pay attention to that holy, reliable, prophetic word as to a light shining in a dark place. You see, being holy, reliable, Scripture reveals the truth. It is absolutely true, absolutely reliable. No mistakes. No wrong perspective. God's view being revealed. Because it, it's wholly reliable, it reveals the truth. It penetrates the darkness of ignorance and the lies of the devil. That's why it's crucial. You see, we just want to sit down here and say, yeah, what do you think? Well, you know, this is it. Oh, no. Figure this out. Figure this out. You know, reason this. And God is telling us. He's giving us truth in his side of the story. That's why the Bible gets attacked so much and gets mocked. 
Because the enemy knows the power of that word is a revelation of God. And so, ah, that's just stupid. That's just old. You know, why don't you get your nose out of that old book? It's these old, you know, figures of people from long ago. You see? But the, the prophetic word, he says, you'll do, you pay attention to that. As to a light shining in a dark place. See, those who ignore God's word, they're losing what, this, what Scripture provides as guidance for one's life. As what it provides as guidance for one's life. And those who ignore it, those who don't take advantage of the light of that revelation, they will not be prepared for the Lord's return. They won't be prepared for the day of judgment. They're out just, you know, doing their own thing. Making stuff up. We can't be trusted to make stuff up. You see, because we have, you know, we are twisted and we have all kinds of agendas that we like to protect and do. And here is God saying, I'm just telling you. I'm telling you the truth. And so this holy, reliable, prophetic word, he says, listen, not only do you have the fact that we were eyewitnesses of his majesty in the transfiguration, which is in some sense a preview of his coming. So I'm telling you this is happening. But you also have the holy, reliable, prophetic word that testifies to that coming. And you'll do well to hold on to that. As opposed to listening to these people who are denying it. You cling to the Bible. You cling to this prophetic word. See, they and we, of course, are to heed the witness of Scripture, he says, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in their hearts. The day Peter is talking about, the day he's talking about, is the day of Christ's return. That's the subject of the discussion. He says, you'll do well to pay attention until that day dawns. You hold on to that. You be involved with it. You pay attention to it until that day dawn. It's what Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, he calls the day of visitation. What he in 2 Peter 3, in chapter 2, verse 9, and chapter 3, verse 7 calls the day of judgment. What he in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10 calls the day of the Lord. What he in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 12 calls the day of God. And what he in chapter 3 verse 18 of 2 Peter calls the day of eternity. You see, this day, this time, when Christ returns, it's the day when the kingdom will be consummated, when this reality will be heavenized, and we'll have the new heavens and new earth. That's what he's talking about. That's what they're denying. And he says, you'll do well to pay attention to these scriptures that testify to the truth of that return. You hold on to until that day dawns. Until that day dawns. See, at that time, he says at that time, the morning star, see, which is probably almost certainly a reference to Jesus Christ. You say, why do you think that? Well, star is used in a number of messianic references. Numbers 24, 17, but most importantly in Revelation 22, 16, Jesus using different words though expresses the same concept, says he is the morning star in Revelation 22, 16. So you see this idea, he says, he says at that time the morning star will rise in our hearts. You say, well, what's that about? What I think he's saying, it will rise in our hearts and that our gratitude for and appreciation of him will become even greater as our faith becomes sight. You see, this is in the vernacular, we will be busting. You see, it is as though like, you know, you and I understand it. We hold to this truth now, but on that day, it's just going to be like a, oh! See, that day. And I used to say many times with our little group, that see, on that day, we'll be hugging one another. And we'll be reflecting on that time we gathered together in this group and talked, you see. And it'll be like joy you can't imagine. Celebration you can't imagine. And see, so this, this idea of this morning star, Christ rising in our hearts and our gratitude and appreciation. We need to heed the witness of Scripture until that time. Because in the brightness of that revelation, the prophetic message will be superfluous. You see, here we are, we're waiting, waiting, but when it dawns, when, when creation or this reality is eternalized, well, then that prophetic message is going to be superfluous. Here's what Peter David says in his commentary. He says, now the prophetic word is a light in the darkness, but when the darkness disappears with the coming of the dawn, we will no longer need the scriptures. 
One treasures a love letter while the beloved is absent, but once he or she is present, the letter is laid aside in exchange for the personal contact. You and I will then live in the immediate presence of God. Right? I mean, we're going, to be, we're going to be in the immediate presence of God. In that perfect reality. The divine utopia. Where there's no death, mourning, crying, pain. Do you see why it's a celebration? You see, it's just going to be not, just joy just pouring out. Pouring out. So he tells them to do well to heed that. Now the holy, reliable, prophetic word to which they and we are to pay attention until Christ returns, is wholly reliable because it's from God and not from man. You see, it's, it's from God and not from man. It's not the thoughts, the opinions, the philosophies, the reasonings, the imaginings of the various prophets. Not at all. See, they functioned as God's instruments. That's why he's telling them this. He says, listen, you'll do well to pay attention to the absolutely reliable prophetic word. And the reason you'll do that is it's absolutely reliable because it's from God. The Bible is from God. It's not like any other book. You see, it's not like any other book. I know what people say. I know how it's subject to attack. That's why they attack it. You see, because here God speaks into this creation. He speaks into this creation. Well, you know that nobody wants it. The enemy sits there and says, listen, I can't have that. That can't stand. So what's he, did God really say that? He didn't really say that, did he? You don't believe that old book, do you? Why do you think people attacked that book and have for centuries? There's a reason. I remember I, I've told you this story before. I remember that guy I used to work with. He was telling me something about the, the uh, Bible, asking me something, you know. And I said, Bob, I, I, I don't think that, that, I love Bob, by the way. But I said, I don't think Bob Cooper in Orlando, Florida is going to be the death knell of the Bible. <laughs> you understand, this book's been around a long time. This book has been attacked by many people over the last few centuries. And that book was here when you came here. And if the Lord doesn't come back first, that book's going to be here when you're gone. <laughs> you see, so, uh, you, you know, it's going to say, well, who killed the Bible? Uh, some nice but obscure gentleman in Florida. He did it. Do you really think so? You see, but it's important to understand. I'm telling you, in our society, in our culture, this idea that the Bible is the word of God needs to be defended and proclaimed and not backed down. And I said, well, you know, there was just some debate with uh, Tony Blair and the uh, dying atheist Hitchens. You know, and that's his thing. You know, yeah, yeah you know, just, just these old savage stories and all this kind of stuff. And we just say, well, I don't know. Why did God kill these people? We need to stand on the Bible and not be ashamed of the Bible and say, well, you know, I don't know. I, you know. The Bible is the Word of God. It is the holy, reliable, prophetic Word. You can take that book to the bank. Now, I understand, you know, how you understand it and all that. You know, yes, I understand. There are nuances, difficulties of understanding. I know all that. But I'm telling you, the message that is revealed there is absolutely the truth. Absolutely the truth. And that's what he's telling them. He says, listen, you need to hang on to that. Now, we are not told the specifics of how the Spirit supernaturally guided the writers in their choice of words. Nowhere do you get that description of here, here's the mechanics of inspiration. But we know that however the Spirit did this, that he did it consistently with the personalities, the different writing styles of the individual writers, so you see, what is happening, it's more complex than somebody sitting in a trance and God simply using them as a vehicle that way. He incorporates their lives, who they are, their experiences. You say, well, how can he then be giving them the words? Well, see, he superintends the entire process. What do you mean? I mean, how, you say, you're asking me, how can the God who spoke this existence into being? You know? From quasars to sand fleas? He spoke them into existence? Well, you know, I think he can superintend the process so that what he gets is exactly what he wanted written. You know, I said, Luke, what did Luke do? Luke went and investigated. You say, well, how can he be investigating? Then it can't be the Word of God. He's investigating. That's Luke. God is, 
you know, he's playing him like a flute. You see, he is superintending the entire process from Luke's education, from, the, from how Luke learned to speak and write. So that what comes out is precisely what God wanted. You see, all I'm saying is that, see, the, the, the process is more complex. And so there, you, you can see there are, it's not all flat. It's not all with the same writing style and voice, but it's all the Word of God. All right, so that's important to hold on to. All right, he then says in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, But there were also false prophets among the people, as there will be also false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And many will follow their licentious acts, because of whom the way of truth will be slandered. And in greed they will exploit you with false words, for whom the condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. He says that as, as there were false prophets among the people of Israel in the days of the true prophets that he's just referred to, so it was foretold that there also would be false teachers among them, as has now occurred. See, that prediction is now playing out in the community he's writing to. As I said in the introduction, it's clear that the heretics are already on the scene. You can see that in a number of places. They were already feasting with the church in chapter 2, verse 13, and were seeking converts from among its members. So they were feasting with the church. You see that in 2.13. You see they are seeking converts from the members. They had perverted Paul's teachings. Chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. And they were ignoring fundamental Christian truth in chapter 3, verses 5 and 7. So I'm with those who I, I think that Peter's probably referring. See, he refers to the false teachers here. He refers to them in the future tense to remind his readers that the, their presence is a fulfillment of earlier Christian prophecies. He wants them to put that in the context that their presence now is a fulfillment of earlier Christian prophecies about their rise. You can see that kind of talk in, in Matthew with, from Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 verse 15, Matthew 24 verse 11. You see other talk in Acts chapter 20 verses 29 and 31. Uh, you know, there you're going to have to see these false teachers. You see that in early Christian teaching this notion of there's going to be false teachers, false prophets rising among you. And he says, that was said before, and here they are among you. Here they are, they're, they're here among you. As Thomas Schreiner says, he reminded his hearers that the advent of the false teachers was foreknown beforehand, and hence that God reigns even in such perilous times. So he has warned them. Early Christian prophecies about the rise of these kinds of people who will come in and destroy communities and people and do that. And he's saying, look, you see, here they are. They're here and they're, they're there among you. Now, he, re he refers to these heretics. You notice he refers to them as false teachers rather than false prophets. Now, it could just be a different way of saying prophets because prophets do teach. So it could just be a stylistic shift that doesn't really have any, you know, he's not signaling anything by that. But it could be that these guys... These particular false teachers, though they come within the, they fall within the earlier prophecies, that they denied prophetic authority, maybe even denying inspiration. You see, we just don't, you have to piece together who are these people. So it could be that these guys didn't claim to be prophets and maybe even disavowed the notion of prophecy. But they are still false teachers and come within this prophecy of false prophets. Okay, so it could be that's why he switches and calls, calls them teachers instead of prophets. Now, even if these heretics didn't claim prophetic authority, they shared characteristics with the false teachers of old. Richard Balkum, in his commentary, he lists three uh, identifying marks of false teachers of old. And the first is that they, they lack divine authority. Okay, they're here representing God, speaking, claiming the truth, but they're not really from God. Right? They lack, divine, they lack divine authority. Secondly, they promise people peace when God threatens judgment. Peace, peace when there is no peace. Don't worry about that. Everything's fine. You have the prophet saying, no, you know, the kingdom's coming, going to destroy Israel, going to destroy Judah. Ah, don't listen to that. Everything's great. 
peace, peace, when there is no peace. Well, this is what these guys are saying. There is no judgment. Live however you want. It's party. You see, we just live the way we want. Don't you have to worry about all that stuff? No judgment. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. And thirdly, is that they will certainly be judged by God. And so, these, see, these people fit. They fall within that, even if they denied, uh, didn't claim prophetic authority. Now, Peter says the false teachers secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. See, they're devious in their method. They secretly bring in destructive heresies. Well, this is how false teachers operate. Now, since they're called arrogant men in chapter 2, verse 10, they probably didn't hide what they taught. You see, they, they think, you know, they hung the moon. You know, they, they have the great insight. They see what nobody else has seen. They're deep. So they probably didn't hide what they're, what they're teaching, but instead they covered up the degree to which their teaching differed from accepted apostolic teaching. You see, that's probably what they're doing. When they're secretly, they're covering up the difference. They're playing off the ignorance of people who can't recognize the difference, and they're kind of just shading this over. No, 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 you know, we're, we're all on the same page, you see, but they weren't. They weren't. They secretly bring in these destructive errors. They're devious in their method. And the errors they push are so serious that they lead to destruction. You see, meaning eschatological punishment. Hell. Can I say that? Can you use that word? That's what he's talking about. Eternal condemnation. As Moo says, any who buy into them find themselves on the road to eternal condemnation. One is reminded of Paul's words in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, where Paul says, but, it, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now that's, that's powerful, right? He's saying, listen... If somebody's over here twisting, distorting, and preaching a false gospel, let that person be condemned. If I do it, or if an angel does it, the truth is that important. And so this is powerful, and you have you know, to see the importance. Mu says regarding this word destructive, which literally, literally says heresy of destruction. So he just turned it into so it says destructive heresies. That's the meaning of it. He says of this word destructive, the word refers to eschatological end time condemnation. As a metaphor for judgment, the word does not carry the literal meaning of annihilate or cease to exist. But with salvation as its opposite, 2 Corinthians 2.15 denotes the eternal loss of fellowship with God. See also John 12.25, Romans 14.15 and other scriptures I won't read. Those who follow the theology of the false teachers will be led not to final salvation, but to condemnation. You see, so here are these people up here, listen, we're deep, we're deep, you know, no, no, you don't have to worry about this, live the way you want to, it's fine, fine, fine. We really have the insight, we really understand. And if you could drop the mask and see what they really are. You see, they're luring, luring, no, this is the way to go. No, 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 I understand. Paul, you can't listen to him. Peter, don't listen to him. I know the way to go. Follow me. You drop that mask. And you see who they really are. Where are they leading you? They're leading to condemnation. That's where they're headed. And they're taking people with them. And that's their goal. They denied Christ who bought them as his slaves through his atoning death on the cross. You're not your own. <laughs> You're bought at a price. Right? You know, the church needs to hear that. You're not your own. You're bought at a price. You're the slave of someone else. Someone else owns you, directs your life, tells you what to do. We hate that. Americans, you know, we just, that just causes us, it's, we chafe under, wait, what are you do? You know, I, I don't want to have somebody, you know, who was it? I don't know if it was Hitchens recently who said, I think it was, who said uh, he didn't want a father looking over his shoulder. You see, he wants to be morally autonomous. He wants to decide how to live, what's right and wrong. And I'm telling you, 
That's the sin in the garden. That's what it is. It is to substitute yourself for God. That is the root of sin. You see, and that's this idea. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to be a creature and bow. I want to be God. I want to be morally autonomous. And reality is, you're not. <laughs> you see? We are creatures, and God has made us, and he calls us. So they're, they're, they denied Christ who bought them as slaves. They're Christians who have now turned from the Lord, and in denying the second coming, and in living immoral lives, these heretics, they're denying his lordship. Here is Jesus, ascended, returning, and calling this is how you're to live. And what are they saying? I'm living the way I want to. Well, what are you saying about who Christ is? Is he Lord or not? You wind up saying, you know, uh, you know why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Luke chapter 6, you know, he says, anybody can say the words. We all have the ability and the vocal cords, the lips and the tongue to say Jesus is Lord. But if it doesn't mean he's Lord... It's meaningless. So here are these people who are saying, listen, you don't have to live this way. You just live as immorally as you want. Doesn't matter. There's no judgment. So they're denying Christ in the way they're, in the way they're living. And as Jesus said in Matthew 10, 33, whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. So he's letting them know. Now in bringing in these destructive heresies, these false teachers they, they bring on themselves the eschatological judgment that will fall suddenly on them in the end. When it comes, it's coming. Okay, so they are, they are doomed, of course, unless they repent. He doesn't go into all that. But they are doomed. And Peter says that many will follow the false teachers by what? By adopting their licentious acts, their sexually immoral ways. Now, if there's ever a society that needs to hear it, we're one. Right? We are sex crazed. And we are pitching this to everybody. You know, everybody. Sex with anything that moves is perfectly fine. That's your right. And if anybody infringes on that and says, no, that's immoral, that's sinful. <gasps> Who are you? You see? So we're just trying so hard to silence that message in our culture. And that's why Christians have to stand. We have to stand up and be, let's say, look, I love you. You see, I love you, and I'm the only one willing to tell you the truth. You see, you may hate me for it, but I love you enough to tell you the truth about it. And the truth about it is, is you cannot live this way. And think that you have any relationship with God. I know you want to convince yourself that that's true. But I wouldn't be a friend to you if I didn't tell you the truth of the matter is you are living in rebellion to God. See, we have to be strong enough to say that. We have to be that voice in the culture. And certainly for one another, we need to be, we need to be saying that. He says that they're, they're going to do this by following their licentious ways. Moo in his commentary says, sadly... There are always those within the church who are attracted to new and different teaching, especially if, like the ideas peddled by these false teachers, it removes the bounds of moral constraint and accountability to a holy judge. We don't like that idea. There's a part of us that doesn't like that. And see, so there always is, we are biased toward swallowing truths that eliminate moral accountability or lies, you know, presented as truth, eliminating moral accountability. We're biased toward that because that sounds, oh, that sounds good. That tickles the ear because that lets me be God. That lets me slip in. And the truth is it's not that way. And so this is something that he, he's facing there. He's fighting with these people and he's telling those he's writing to, he says, listen, you have, to, you, you have to recognize this. Now, the problem of false teaching, it becomes even more acute as popular culture increasingly swallows the notion, the self-defeating notion, I might add, that there is no objective truth. I say self-defeating because you recognize it in saying there's no objective truth. I'm claiming that as a truth, right? So it is self-defeating. It's insane. But... Our culture kind of likes it. Why? Because it fits in with this idea. You don't want to judge. 
You don't know anything anybody else knows. You, know, you, don't, you don't want to judge and it allows me to be God. There is no truth. So as that grows in our culture, see, in that environment, Christians easily become more comfortable witnessing for their faith, not in terms of its truth, but in terms of its utility. Right? Well, you know, no, you need to consider Christ because, you know, He'll help with your family, or he'll help you do this, or he'll improve your business, or he'll do this. See, he's a good tool in your life. Instead of, you need to be interested in Christ because Christ is the truth. The truth is, you and I are creatures. We live in a place that has been created by God. Where do you think you came from? Do you think you, you, know, you popped into an existence you had nothing to do with? Right? Now, I know people are trying to convince you, but no, 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 no. Where you came from, you came from nowhere out of nothing by chance. A like quantum fluctuation somewhere. 13.7 billion, <laughs> shake that baby and out you come. Okay? Now, I got to tell you, it's insane. It is insane. But yet, the people controlling the establishments... Say, I'm insane. And they're telling you, you're insane. And that's all they, they all, and, but there's a reason, there's a method to the madness. You see, there's a war going on. There's a method to the madness. There's a war going on here. So here, you know, as we wind up, see, losing this sense of truth, not defending Christianity in terms of truth, we become less concerned with the truth. And as Moose says, as such a situation provides a golden opportunity for false teachers to enter our, rank, enter our ranks and prey on those who simply do not know much about what they believe or why. Right? I mean, you, just, you have people who are vulnerable sitting there, theologically anemic. Why? It's because they don't think any of this stuff matters. Who cares? I believe Jesus. I don't need this, but you see how big that book is? <laughs> you think, I'm going to spend time, so they're spending all kinds of time learning every video game in the world. I can spend hours doing that. That's really important. I can go to school to learn to make money. And I have no qualms with that. But isn't this important enough that we have to absorb some of this? So that we are not so theologically anemic that we're sitting ducks for this kind of stuff. All right, well, see, that's the idea. See, that's in, in shepherding. You see? Shepherding is helping us in that regard. To grow up spiritually, to grow up theologically, it's an, it's an important thing. Now, those who follow the, the follow the false teachers in their sinful ways, they'll cause the truth, they'll cause Christianity to be slandered or blasphemed. That's, what the, that's going to be the effect. When people see those who wear the name of Christ living in sin and rationalizing it, the Christian faith is discredited. Right? When you're out here cheating on your spouse and telling your buddies at work, yeah, you know, my old lady, she doesn't know anything. You know, we're really, I'm really putting one over on her. You see? What do you think that does? And you, you got the nerve to wear the name Jesus? What do you think that people sit there and say, Christ is a joke? That's the net effect of that. Christ is a joke. Now you think of what you're doing to the one who died for you. You are causing people to look on him and mock and laugh and say there is nothing to this, there's no power there. This is a joke. It's not true. And you're fueling that, and that's what he's telling them. If you fall in with this, when he says here, listen, many will follow their licentious act because of whom the way of truth will be slandered. That's the net effect of it. And we have to stop it. You know, we have to stop it. This is what we wind up doing when we act that way. Now he says the false teachers are motivated by greed. See, they're exploiting the believer's vulnerability by feeding them lies that they are willing, if not eager, to lap up. You see, that's how I get, that's how I get altitude. I come in and I got my own little niche that I'm working. 
You know, I got my own angle, and now I become a rock star. See, I'm, I'm, I understand this. Everybody else, they don't understand it. But I, I am the enlightened one, and here I am. See, I'm feeding you this stuff. Really? You mean I can, I'm free! Grace, baby, I can live any way I want. No judge, don't worry about any of that stuff. Don't worry about how you live. Yeah, that's it, that's all legalism. You just get rid of all that stuff. That's legalism. Thinking that there's a connection between how you live and your submission to Jesus Christ. Ah, don't listen to that. Well, see, these false teachers, they're peddling that, and apparently they're somehow receiving an economic benefit from doing so. I don't know if they're being kept up. People are feeding them. I don't know what it is. He doesn't tell us. But he says they're motivated by greed, and you see it in the world. You see people who wind up pitching junk, and they got churches full of people throwing money at them. Full of it. You know, just, you've seen them. Right? And so there's an element there of, hey, I'm living high off of what? Off of what I'm selling. You see, and so this is something that's... Now, the judgment plan for these false teachers from long ago, it's not idle. Thanks for coming. 